This morning's Bible reading comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Um, and just a reminder that um, if you don't have a Bible of your own, there are Bibles out on the front table there, just near the, the entrance door. Um, and you're quite welcome to take one of those with you so that you can have a Bible of your own. But um, passage again, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each one of you. For as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Good morning, everyone. It's good to good to see you this morning. My name's Dean. I've got the privilege of being the pastor here. On on Thursday, I was um had arranged to meet up with um Matt Ray after school, and so I walked from here down to um towards his place, and he lives on the other side of of Grand Prix Park there, and and um of course there's a there's a big lake, uh, a man-made lake that's there, and um and and there's this family of swans that uh that are there in the lake and and uh and they're on the, the grass sort of um between the lake and and south circuit there and i just remember thinking um gee, i hope there's no cats to tear them to pieces or you know kill them anyway well welcome to the refuge and um it's, uh, it's good to see you, and you've come this morning sort of um, smack bang in the middle, smack bang in the middle, hang on, I've just got to lift this up here, there we go, um, smack bang in the middle of a series um, that we're calling the, the Refuge 5G Network, and it's a, a, I guess it's a series focusing on our vision, uh, what we deem to be our mission uh, given to us for, from God um, in this area amongst one another. Uh, focusing on um, the five G's, uh, and the five G network is is glory. That is, we need to be a worshiping community. Uh, we were reminded about that today, and it's good to be reminded about that. Uh, we need to be a, a going community, uh, being uh, living out our sentness, uh, the the mission that we've been given. Uh, today, we're focusing on the fact that we're a community of groups, um, and and making the most of opportunities to to gather together at different places and at different times with different people, and like I said, we're we're looking at that one today. Next week, God willing, we'll be looking at growth and what it means to uh, to mature in Christ and to encourage each other in terms of that to grow in our relationship with Jesus, and then uh, gifting, uh, uh, taking what God has given us and uh, blessing those amongst us and blessing those around us intentionally uh, with the abundance that God has given us, the, the means in which he's given us to be able to do that. And, that's, uh, and they're important things for us to be thinking about, and it's been good to, to focus on those things, and they're the things that we want to continually talk about, they're the things we want to continually focus on and pursue and look at in terms of uh, each other personally as a, as a church. Groups, our gatheredness, it's an important, this week we've been reminded about how important it is to be together 
in terms of living life and doing life. So, you know, the football finals. And there's this picture you see of, of a group of people and they're gathered together. And they're together in the joy of victory or they're together in the despair of defeat. But they're sharing that experience. And as humanity, we value that. We, we get together in our colours of team, our colours of tribe, and we sing the songs of team, sing the songs of tribe, and, and we value that. It's an important part of our connectedness. The death of Queen Elizabeth. And we've seen images all over the world of peoples gathering together to grieve, to mourn, to reflect, to remember. And it's an important part of our humanity to do that. And to do it is significant. This week, that the terrible accident down in Buxton. And again, we've seen people who are coming together to, to, to lay flowers, to support one another, to put an arm around one another, to pray together, to remember together, to reflect together as a community. And it's important that that happens, to embrace and have an outpouring of grief, to share stories of reflection and remembrance. That's a essential quality of humanity. See, there's something powerful, there's something needed, and indeed I reckon there's something normal about people gathering together in order to share their joys and also to share their sorrows. It just makes sense. And equally, there's something devastating, there's something wrong when you can't cheer together and when you can't shed a tear together. There's something devastating when the narrative of loneliness overshadows the need to be able to gather. So much so, there's a position in the UK government now called um, the Minister of Loneliness or Minister for Loneliness. There's a growing body of evidence that shows just how incredibly emotionally and physically damaging loneliness is. The commentator Hugh Mackay said that there's an inevitable outcome of a culture that celebrates individualism. And it's found in lonely people everywhere. So we've already heard in this uh, passage in, in Romans 12, have a look at it in, in sentence two, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I want to say that the G that we're focusing on today, you know, groups or, or gathering together, I, I reckon it's the most confronting G of them all. It's this, in our gatheredness and the way we do it and the reason we do it, it's where we are most distinctive from other gathered communities and the community at large in the world. It's where we most clearly do not conform to the patterns of the world. Church, God's people come together. It's where we most do not conform to the patterns of the world in which you and I live in. I remember a, 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 quite a few years ago, I woke up one morning and I was just in excruciating pain. I was screaming in pain. It was a, a masculine scream, but it was a scream all the same. And, and for, for, for days leading up to this particular morning, I had been having considerable toothache and had been sucking on a lot of Panadol and pain-relieving substances in order to uh, deal with that. But uh, this particular morning, it all just got too much for me. I woke up and I was just in agony. I was in agony. And it, I went uh, got to the dentist and found out I had an infection. It was a really bad infection. I needed to have root canal surgery. And so they put me in and I actually had to get a needle of stuff 
put into my nerve ending. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced pain like that before. It's like giving birth to 10 babies. That that pain is just ridiculous. So it was, I, I, I don't know how I didn't pass out. I, I just must, must have been like so tough. No, they, I, 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 it was just so hard and, and I had to have immediate extraction and, and surgery. And the dentist, otherwise known as this mad scientist, he showed me the offending tooth after he pulled it out. This little tooth, this little insignificant tooth. And I'm going to tell you, it stopped my world. I couldn't function. I couldn't cope. I couldn't do anything. I, I was just needed it, get, got rid of, because it just affected me so much. It stopped me, and I couldn't put my attention on anything else. Some of you have known pain like that, that your body has just stopped you from doing anything. Now look with me at sentence four and five. For just as each of us has one body, with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Now, that is amazing. Those two sentences, in an amazing couple of paragraphs, but those two sentences in and of themselves, we should be amazed. I mean, wow. Look at sentence four. Each of us, each of us are one body. But at the same time, each of us are many members. Each of us are different. And therefore, this gatheredness in whatever context in which that happens, but our coming together in groups, our coming together in teams, our coming together in congregating, It, this tells us that we are all necessary, that we are all needed, that we are all essential, that we are all important, that we are all precious and valued and valuable and missed if we are not connected. But then Paul says something that raises the bar considerably. See, the key phrase in sentence five, have a look at it. He says, so in Christ. Given what I've just said, that everyone realizes about the body and about community and about teams and about tribes and about cultures. What I've just said, and then he says in sentence five, so in Christ. See, I think it's important that we get the significance of what the Bible is saying here. Because he, he's... He's talking about so in Christ. And of course, we think about those of us who are walking with Jesus, what that means for us, what that means for me, what that means for my life, if I'm in Christ. So, so in Christ, in my relationship with the risen Jesus Christ, get this, in my personal connection with the Son of God, with the reality of Jesus and his saving grace that has changed my life, that has changed my story, that has changed my priorities and changed my eternity. And then look at what he says in sentence five. In Christ, even though we are many, but in Christ, we form one body. And in Christ, each member belongs to all the others. You see, that's surprising. Because it's not what we would have written if we were responsible for writing the Bible. So I would expect it to read uh, in, in sentence five there, so in Christ, so many form one body and each member belongs to God. Each member belongs to to Jesus Christ. Now, come on, because that's what we would say. That's what we come out with, because it sounds more spiritual, doesn't it? It sounds more significant, doesn't it, if we put it in those words. But the Bible doesn't put it in those words. 
God doesn't describe that reality with those words. He says that we belong to everyone else. He says that, that we belong to one another. He says that we belong to all the others. Now, before we move on, we just need to stop to all the others. What does it mean for us, for me to belong, for you to belong to all the others? I tell you, the stakes just got a whole lot higher and so potentially did the degree of discomfort if not all, then in most of us here who are indeed in Christ. Because if that's what God is really saying, and if that's what God really says, then we don't get to limit all the others to my Bible study group or my age demographic or my relationship status or my financial position or my level of education, or my mother tongue language, especially if it's English, or my suburb, or my political affiliation, or my personal comfort. See, we should make refuge t-shirts that says, each belongs to all, or, you know, loving God, serving you i mean you think look, the school song the, the the second verse there you know, we are one 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 when we come together count us one two three come and sing with me stand by you if you're by me we're holding hands we're living dreams we are one 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 and we're all living in natural harmony Orange park public school song straight out of the bible i mean it's incredible I mean, this week, this week, we had new iPhones distributed or made available. People lining up to get the newest, shiniest installment. You know, it was only in 2010 when Apple introduced the front-facing camera on their phones. Just 2010. It looks like it's been there forever. But in just 2010. And I read recently that the original intention for the front-facing camera was so that people could have you know, make FaceTime calls with each other. But it wasn't long before the front-facing camera was used for selfies. And, and, and it wasn't long. It was within four years, people all over the world were taking a billion selfies a day. They say that there are 60 deaths a year because people are not taking notice of things around them, but they're taking selfies over their phone. In Russia... They had a state-sponsored safe selfie campaign. And the tagline was, even a million likes is not worth your life. Now, I'm no problem with selfies. But I do think that we as God's people, that we who are in Christ, we have to continually and consciously fight the temptation for individualism. We have to continually and consciously fight that reality in our lives and in our culture. Then, and I'll tell you, it's something that you find from the opening pages of the Bible right through to the last page, that God has made us for himself, but he's also made us for others. And this is clear in our Christian understanding of, of things like marriage and family, but also of church of gathering together, of grouping together. In the lived out reality of Jesus' words in, in John 13, where he says, by, by this will all people know you are my disciples if you love one another. So the, the Christian life, it's a, it is a, it's, a, it's a personal relationship with Jesus but it can't be a private relationship with Jesus. We've heard many times recently, there are a lot of things you can do as a Christian, but, but, but 
there's a lot of things you can do, but the Christian life alone, but there is that the, the there are a lot of things you can do alone, but the Christian life is not one of them. That's right. See, it does take a church to raise a Christian. Some of you will know that that story found in in, um, in Mark 10 uh, the, the, of the rich young man who who came to Jesus and wanted to follow him. And, and Jesus in that story in, in Mark 10 tells him to go away and to give away his riches and his possessions and then come back and follow him. And, and the story goes that this guy went away sad because he loved his wealth and he couldn't bring himself to let him go to part himself with them. And then there's this amazing teaching that Jesus gives to his disciples. And, and this is wonderful, um, but what comes at the end is often missed out in terms of exactly what we're talking about today. In, in Mark 10, 28, it says, then Peter spoke up. We've left everything to follow you. This guy wasn't prepared to leave his life behind. He says, hey, we've left everything to follow you. He's talking to Jesus. And Jesus says in 29, truly I told you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Now, some of us have come from, from church cultures where that teaching has been turned on its head and it's like, become a follower of Jesus and you'll get mega bucks, you'll get mega homes, you'll get mega possessions and life will be easy. It's not what Jesus is saying. See, the disciples are focusing on, on what they have chosen to miss out on in order to be a Jesus follower. What they've been willing to leave behind in order to follow Jesus Christ. And let's be honest, it's not hard to think like that, is it? And, and, and so many people today will hesitate to follow Jesus because of what they imagine they will have to give up. And there could well be people here, and that's how you're thinking. I don't know if I want to follow Jesus. I have to give up so much in order to do it. But notice that Jesus doesn't allow that sort of thinking. He, in fact, he turns it on its head with the point he goes on to make. And, and, and do you notice what he says? He says, yeah, some of you will be kicked out of home. You'll be disowned by father, mother, brother, sister, and society for following Jesus. And I've got to tell you, there are some people with us, amongst us today at the refuge, who, who, who have experienced that very thing. He says, yeah, some of you will lose your job. And you will lose your income. And you'll lose your property your fields and farms, because you're following me. And I know that there are some people who have had to endure some of that in their story, even amongst us today. But here's the thing. Here's the wonderful thing about gathering and groups and Christian community as defined by Jesus. Get this, because this is our commitment. This has to be our commitment at the refuge. When you follow Jesus, notice it says in the present age, in this present age, all of a sudden, yeah, you might lose your home. But you know what? You lose your home, you automatically have access to a hundred others. Because you now belong to all the others. If your house catches on fire and is destroyed. There are, in this room, there are hundreds of homes that you can be a part of. Uh, he says, you know, by your commitment to Jesus, you might lose your family. But you're adopted into God's family. And so you now have 100 mums and 100 dads hundreds of brothers and sisters, hundreds of uncles and aunties, hundreds of grandparents, because now you belong to all the others. Yeah, being a disciple might cost you your job, but you have fellowship and you have love 
and you have the protection and the food and the water and the shelter and the clothes of a hundred different households because you now belong to all the others. And you may well suffer persecution, but you have hundreds of helping hands and you have hundreds of persistent prayers and prayers every single day and on into eternity because you now belong to all the others. That's the guarantee of the gathered community of believers. That's how it is all over the world. And that's Jesus' word for the refuge. And that's why, isn't it, when you spill a glass of water on the floor, it's frustrating and you have to clean it up. But if you spill a glass of water in the ocean, it gets distributed into the mass and the enormity of the sea consumes it and you don't even really feel it or notice it at all. And in the same way, friends, we are blessed in order to be a blessing to others. In the same way, our losses are easier to navigate when the weight of them is shared amongst one another. And that's just not a nice sentiment on a Hallmark card. It's the Bible, and it's right through the Bible. And it's even in how the Bible is put together. It's how the Bible is actually constructed. You think about it. We have the Psalms, and so many of the Psalms, aren't they? They're written by people who are suffering and are lamenting. But the thing is we need to remember is that the Psalms are songs that are sung. They're songs that are sung in the congregation or in the gathered people of faith. Think about it. The one suffering has his announcement of the pain of his or her suffering shared in chorus with people who are standing right there next to him or her, right there with him or her. And with one voice, they share in the rhythm and the harmony and the melody they share in the very heart beat of a brother and sister who is suffering. That's what happens in the book of Psalms. You think about we have the, the books in the New Testament, the Gospels and, and, and the, the epistles, Paul's writings and the other New Testament writers. Get this, with the way in which it was put together, the way in which it was first communicated, Groups of people gathered together and they were read out loud for them to listen to, for them to take in. And people gathered together were hearing encouragement and they were hearing rebuke and they were hearing wisdom and they were hearing direction and doctrine and they were hearing guidance. And they're hearing it together and they're processing it together and they're applying it together. And then they're living it out together. We have the Psalms. We have the New Testament books. We have the, the book of Revelation. In Revelation 7, sentence 9, the picture is anything but individual. Because it's the community of believers from every town, tribe, and tongue. And they're gathered together in praise and glory of God. It's not the language of me it's the language of us it's not what will be heaven what will heaven be like for the individual the bible doesn't even think about answering that question the bible says that heaven well, the picture of heaven for the community for the gatheredness for the multitude that no one can count so, friends, we invite you. We invite you to join us at the refuge. And we invite you to invite others to join us at the refuge. And, and imagine this. You, you, you step into our lives and our commitment to you is to invest time in you. To engage in redemptive relationships and faith friendships with you to share our pains and our joys with you and to give you opportunity and invite you to share your pains and your joys with us. 
like, well, that's what a body does. And we're one body with many parts. See, we like to think if one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. But it's also true, isn't it, that if one part of the body is, is, is happy and healthy, then the body is healthy and happy. Speaking God's word to one another and praying God's will for one another. That's what our promise is to each other. And it's a biblical mandate, not just a good idea. This week there was our new OK Day. I'll tell you, you can't have our new OK Day in isolation, can you? It doesn't work. It, it just, you have to have someone to ask that question to. You have to have someone ask you that question. Uh, we talked about before a community event coming up. And isn't it wonderful that we have a, a, a community council and a, 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 a Oran Park community uh, of, of leaders who are organising community events and they're asking the refuge to be a part of that to come along and be present at that and to be involved in that. That's a, that's a massive thing. But will we have that opportunity to do that? And we know, don't we? See, we already know that when people come, that they'll be coming and they'll be lonely and they'll be isolated and they'll be vulnerable and they'll be distant from one another. We already know that. And we have a story to tell. We have the greatest story ever told to tell. We are not the person we used to be. And isn't it true that there's something even more powerful in community than saying, hey, this is what happened to me. And then what's more powerful than saying this is what happened to me is to have people say this is what happened to us. We have acceptance instead of rejection. We have assurance of life after death. We have no condemnation. We cannot be separated from God's love. And we have grace and we have mercy and we belong and we are reconciled to God, and we have freedom in Christ, and we are chosen, and we are adopted, and we have been given fullness, and we are loved and wanted, and all this is made possible because of Jesus, the Messiah, who died and rose again. And it's all declared, and it's all lived out in community, in our gatheredness, in our group. Friends, Get connected, if you're able to, to a, a connect group. Be involved in a ministry team and do life and ministry together in that way. Let me encourage you, if you can, if you get a text from someone, give them a call. If you get a call from someone, suggest a catch-up. When you're tempted to hang out with people who are just like you, make a decision to get beside someone who is different from you. Discover the blessing of having very little in common with someone except for the fact that you are both in Christ. The real community, it's not found in FaceTime, it's found in face-to-face. -face. True happiness isn't found by your picture being right found in your soul, in your story, in your self being loved. And the greatest commandment from our Lord is to love God, love your neighbor. Last week, Andrew Smith was our preacher and he gave an illustration about a guy who was doubting about the validity of the Christian faith and the Christian life. So he's taken to meet a person and the person said, hey, just watch me. Just watch me. Watch my life. You take that from last week 
we come to this week and we lift the level because then we say, hey, watch us. You watch us at the funeral. You watch us at the refuge. You watch us at our connect group. You watch us in our ministry team. You watch us as we do life. See how we speak to each other. See how we love one another. See how we love you. But watch us. Now let's be watching. And let's pray. Lord God, we want to thank you today. It's so amazing when we think about the fact that you are a God who knows us. You know us. And the very existence of the church, the very existence of a gathered community of believers, and it's here and it's so many other parts of this country and so many, so many other parts of the world where your people are gathering together. And the very fact of our gatheredness is miraculous. It tells a story. It is a light in a world that needs to know and be reminded about connection and about love and about acceptance, and about generosity, and about mercy and grace. Lord God, we thank you for your word that speaks of how you have called us and what you have called us to. And that is to you and also to one another. And Lord God, we as a church in general have been so... The church across the world has been so slow at, at, at taking the opportunities of what that might look like. Forgive us for that, God. But Lord, help us to love you and love our neighbor. Help us, Lord God, to get to know one another. Help us to exist knowing that we are saved by your amazing grace, but that message of grace is to be lived through us to a world that needs to have the grace narrative written into their life. Help us to help each other. Help us to love one another. Help us to love you and to serve one another. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.